This has been a very different summer in terms of planning for the school district. Um, these are certainly, as we've heard before, unprecedented times. We wanted to provide you some important information as we prepare for the first day of school on Monday, August 10th. I'm Scott Howitt. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for Orange County Public Schools. We appreciate everyone being here for this media availability. As many of you know, the first nine days of school will be delivered through Launch Ed at Home for all students. This means that all students will be taught and interact with their teachers through our OCPS Launch Ed virtual program. We want to thank, uh, we want our parents and staff to know that we understand this is an extremely challenging time and we appreciate their patience. We want to thank our amazing teachers, classified support staff, principals, and administrators for their hard work and dedication in getting us ready to start school on Monday. You may have seen in, in recent OC, the recent OCPS COVID-19 Health and Safety Procedures Manual that was released last week. Sherry actually has a copy of that as well. It's a 76-page document posted on the front page of the OCPS website, and it covers many of the questions parents and the community have about our procedures that are in place going forward during the pandemic. This is a living document, meaning that it will be updated. Current version up there is version 1.0, and we will have a 2.0 that will be posted soon. There have been some questions about student device distribution. This past spring, as a result of the global pandemic and the necessity for our students to be connected not only at school, but at home, the board made a decision to step up the district's efforts and accelerate our device distribution plan by more than a year. The original plan was to become a one-to-one -one district, meaning every student had a device by 2021. However, due to the pandemic, a decision was made by the board to accelerate that plan and move it up by a full year. We know that all returning secondary students currently have a device that they were issued last year that they carried over for the summer and will have for this year. With many students logging on for the first time, we wanna remind them to make sure that they, they do so once they receive the device and that it's uh, functioning properly. They may not have logged on in a while and we wanna make sure that it works well for them. The vast majority of devices that are being distributed are being distributed through our elementary schools. That's where we have uh, accelerated our distribution. Many of our, uh, most of the vast majority of our elementary schools have received devices already and just a handful were uh, in route for today and will be distributed throughout the weekend. OCPS has increased its bandwidth in, in a number of areas and increased its access points to help prevent any uh, issues or try to deal with any interruptions. We are relying on our local internet providers to assist in support since many of the online traffic will throw, flow through the student's home device or home internet connection or uh, their mobile device. If we do experience a surge, we want everyone to um, uh, be patient with us as we work with our area providers. We know there will be issues. And while the beginning of school for us looks much different, than it has in the past. And in the past, it's usually very smooth. We know that this start may be a little choppy and a little rough. We're gonna address those issues and we're gonna work hard to assist our families and students in need. If parents and students experience uh, connectivity issues, we suggest that they try turning their computer on and off unplugging the internet connection for 10 seconds, turning it back on, contacting their local internet provider. Um, if, if we um, provided a student with a hotspot, they can call that hotspot provider 
uh, that, that they received um, the hotspot from. They can also call or email the school to log their concern of what's happening with their device. Um, we know that 63% of our students have selected launch at home, even though 100% of them will be doing it for nine days, that 63% of them will continue beyond um, the 21st. So here to talk to us today a little bit about uh, launch at home, and he'll give us a demonstration later, is our senior director of digital learning, Maurice Dragon. Maurice? Good morning, all. For the past six years, Orange County Public Schools, with the generous support of our community through the one mail sales tax, has implemented LaunchEd in our schools. LaunchEd is our one-to-one -one program that provides a device for each child, hardware and infrastructure upgrades for schools and classrooms, and professional development for teachers. Each year, a new cohort or group of schools are added to the Launch Ed program. We are excited this year to complete our final two cohorts, cohort seven and eight. This year, we're also utilizing key components of the Launch Ed program for our innovative model, Launch Ed at Home. Students will utilize their digital device to access the dashboard launchpad at launchpad.ocps.net and the learning management system Canvas, which is available on their launchpad dashboard. They will use this to interact with their teachers from home. These resources are not new to our teachers and students. They are adjusting, however, to using them in an all day at home model. For many, the core question about lounge ed at home is what will it look like? Teacher knowledge and creativity guide the lessons that they create and share with students every day. Teachers are able to modify the use of resources provided through lounge ed to create a lounge ed at home experience that meets the need of their individual classroom or students. So while Launch at Home classrooms may use the same resources, how it will specifically look will be dependent on the individual teacher. We have worked with our partners to test, to upgrade, and to provide additional capacity for Launch at Home. The goal of the team is to provide the best experience possible for our teachers, students, and their families, and to provide quick support if an issue is encountered. Launch it at home is all about teaching and learning, and not about the technology. But here are some specific technical steps we have taken. We've added additional capacity and servers to manage logins to our district dashboard launch pad. We've also added additional redundancy to back up both internally and externally those servers. Two, we've added additional capacity and load management to our learning management system, Canvas. Three, we've added additional capacity and servers to our video conferencing platforms that integrate into our learning management system, Canvas. We've also integrated a second video conferencing platform to give teachers additional choice and a backup if they run into issues with the one that they're using. We are going to continue to monitor, adjust, and work to make sure that Launch at Home provides the best learning experience for our teachers, students, and parents who have selected this model. And Maurice has a classroom set up, so he's gonna do some demonstrations in a little bit. 
So at this time, I would like to um, talk a little bit about uh, food nutrition services. So beginning on Monday, food nutrition services will provide meals to students utilizing um, uh, launch at home model through, uh, well, they'll actually, um, those that are utilizing the launch at home model will be able to do curbside pickup meals. And um, uh, Laura Gilbert is here, our senior director of food nutrition services to talk a little bit about that. What we want to do is ensure that all students will receive a nutritious meal, even though they're not in school during that time. Unlike the summer program, this new curbside meal program will require students to uh, bring their student ID. Uh, Laura is gonna talk a little bit about the changes and um, what to expect when you come to school uh, for curbside. So, uh, Laura, thanks. Good morning. Every day in school, the Food and Nutrition Program provides a healthy, nutritious, and great tasting meal to the students. And how do I know that? Because every single healthy item goes in front of a taste test with students, and it has to score an 80% or higher in order to even be put on our menu. So we want this year to be particularly great to make sure that the kids enjoy their meals. Breakfast and lunch will be available at all OCPS schools across the district. Launch Ed students learning at home will be provided the curbside meals every Monday, half an hour after the last bell at their enrolled school. And that will last for a total of one and a half hours. Curbside meal pickup will occur on Mondays only. And so they will get all five days worth of meals on Monday. While there was no charge for meals during the summer program, during the regular school year, students will eat at their eligibility status. That means that students who apply for a free and reduced application, if they're approved, will continue to eat at no charge. Every student has to have a new application by September 23rd. So we will honor last year's applications until September 23rd. But let me tell you, the free and reduced program is there for all parents this year. If they have experienced any change in income or are worried about being able to have enough money for food, we encourage them to go to our OCPS Food and Nutrition website and fill out an application. That application does a lot of good for the school district as well. The parents, in addition to receiving free meals if they are approved, will also get discounts on utilities, after school programs, and summer camps. There are all kinds of waivers for college application fees and SAT tests. So we really want every parent who is experiencing a change in income to apply for an application this year. Schools in the Community Eligibility Program, or what we call our CEP, will continue to get meals at no charge. The difference this year is because we're doing meals face-to-face -face for students that are in the schools and the launch ed stu students at the curbside on Mondays, we will need a student ID. And so if they don't have a student ID, we ask them to print it in a large font and show it as they come through to get their curbside meal. We are expanding our program in the CEPs schools so that now we have 134 schools that qualify for the CEP program. So again, parents can go to our website and find out if their school where their child is enrolled offers meals at no charge. We are offering our, very, our students very favorite items. So while elementary students love Tex-Mex foods, we also have spaghetti with meat sauce, tangerine chicken, and macaroni and cheese. You know what? It is a treat to eat school meals these days. Middle and high school students favor mandarin chicken, island beans with plantains, spicy, and I do mean spicy for the middle and high school students. We have Caribbean jerk sauce, we have a sofrito sauce, and they're uh, 
pretty tangy, pretty, pretty uh, hot. We have a Fiesta taco bowl that's made with freshly chopped ingredients. And most of our entrees, I'm glad to say, will continue to be made from scratch in our kitchens. So I hope that all students are encouraged to pick up their meals either through Launch Ed or at the face-to-face. -face. And all parents should apply for a free and reduced application if their students are not enrolled in a CEP program. Thank you. So thanks, Laura. And the the food the food bus is out is outside. I know many of you have already seen that. So real important for us to get that information out to our our students that um, that receive meals throughout the year or need to receive meals. Uh, that change is important. And on the front page of our website, you can go there and click on curbside meals, and it'll give more details. So uh, that and also um, the other resources are there as well. Also, FAQ, we're working on updating that daily. And uh, the FAQ is out there for, uh, for parents and, um, and the community. So at this time, we'll um, entertain some questions. I know I'm going to let Maurice go and set up. And we also have um, a walkthrough in the back in the kitchen so you can get some, um, some footage of, of them preparing some of the meals. So Scott, questions? Sure. So uh, some of the samples of our PPE are there. They're being delivered out to the school. Many of them have already been distributed. Of course, over the next nine days, they'll be continuing to, to receive supplies. Procurement had started purchasing supplies back in May, when, knowing that, the in, of course, everyone was purchasing PPE supplies at the same time. So this is a sample of some of the things that are, that are coming in. Some of the uh, – we have um, – gowns if they're requested every teacher will get uh be issued masks uh and and some of the mask examples there uh, students will get uh, reusable masks as well as disposable masks will be available hand sanitizer that's an example of some hand sanitizer that uh, will be delivered uh, to the schools for the classrooms to be able to have those as well so uh every school will get five thermometers uh, to do periodic temperature checks uh, example of a thermometer is there. So we're, we're not only ordering, but continuing to order. I think um, uh, uh, wipes, uh, we have uh, enough to get us started, but that's something that we're going to continue to go on and order because those are extremely backlogged as well. So desk partitions, we haven't done that. We have a mandatory mask requirement. So, uh, you know, students will be required to wear a mask. Teachers will be required to wear a mask in the classroom unless they medically cannot uh, wear a mask. So desk partitions in that case may be used if they can't wear a mask, but right now masks and shields are provided to, shields are provided to teachers. So that'll provide their partition and then masks are required for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Well, not getting on the bus. One of the concerns about massive uh, temperature checks is you end up getting large groups of children gathering together in one area. That's the last thing you want to do if you're trying to social distance and prevent the spread of the virus. So we think that doing periodic checks, like when the buses arrive at school, to be able to periodically check uh, those that are getting off the bus, those are that are coming in from cars, those are that are that are coming in. Um, through the attendance office maybe, and, and checking temperatures that way uh, versus doing it every day outside of the bus. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of um, different uh, research on doing temperature checks and, and the efficacy of that. So I think making sure that we're doing it uh, periodically throughout the school at certain times. And then, of course, anyone who is sent to um, – you know, the clinic will be temperature checked, obviously, uh, as they normally would. Yeah. Yeah. That, 
that was the other issue is um, if they had a temperature, leaving them there unsupervised uh, without maybe a parent to come pick them up, leaving a, you know, a five or six year old at the bus stop because they have a, a, a fever or, or register. Um, so, and they will be required to wear masks on the bus. They'll be given a, a PPE if they don't have one and there's hand sanitizer and other things. So they'll, they have assigned seating. They're gonna load the bus back to front, make sure that they're limiting um, all of the, the possible ways that, uh, that students will cross paths and, and try to do that in a way that is, that is safe. Uh, at, at this point, I know what you know. The the, the teachers declared impasse. We certainly um, we certainly uh, would hope that uh, you know we can work through the issues. We've uh, laid out uh, very specific things in in our procedures manual and other things that we're doing. So you know that'll be resolved in in time. Uh, right now, we're just focused on making sure we're serving the children and getting them uh, what they need to get to get their education this year kicked off on the right foot. So if, if a student is launched at, at home, they're at home for the nine weeks. If a teacher uh, can select to teach launch ed from their classroom, or to teach launch ed from home, uh, if they're if they're assigned that, and and that's all been uh, you know they've registered their preferences as far as what they've wanted to do. A lot of them that are doing launch ed you know, even for the next nine days would probably come into their classroom and then do launch ed for their students from their classroom. But it's not either, yeah, I think that's a school by school issue. Uh, I think, uh, Principal Ivory, have you dealt with that situation where some teachers may want to come in on certain days into the classroom and then they want to teach from home on others? Yes. So yeah, so, so that could, that's a possibility that could happen. Yes. So basically they have to let Oh, sorry. Can you tell me how summer school went over um, with cases of, of the schools? Do we know if you guys had any issues, if any schools had to shut down, or how was the process for summer school here in Orange County? Yeah, the summer, uh, summer school was um, was small. We didn't have a large number in summer school. There was a lot of um, the classrooms were limited in size. Uh, we didn't have any, I don't, not that we were made aware that there was any cases. We had uh, cases at schools in certain areas. Like at one time, I think we had checked, we had 18 out of our, you know, uh, 4,000 plus employees that were working during the summer that had, that had reported it. And, you know, at that time, but very, very minimal, very limited as far as that goes. And, and I didn't hear of any, any student cases. Sierra, did you have a question? Yeah. So, well, Maurice, Maurice actually is, in, is over the training, so he could probably talk a little bit about training, but secondary students different than elementary, so you could probably talk a little bit about that. Um, certainly. So, I think one of the key things to, with Launch at, at Home, when we think about the components that I talked about before, is that Launch at, at Home uses components from our Launch at program. And so that means that, for example, with secondary our secondary has been using the components of Launch Ed for the past three or four years because they've all been one-to-one. -one. So on average, let's say before the pandemic occurred, we had on average 325,000 logins per day to Launchpad, our district dashboard. So our teachers and our students were already using it. For Canvas, we have on average around 200,000 logins per day to Canvas. That was pre-pandemic. So many of our teachers and students were already using it. And so that's why I was mentioning before that with many of these components, it's not really understanding or being introduced to them for the first time. It's really understanding how to extend them in a purely digital format because teachers are used to going back and forth between their face-to-face -face classroom and using it in, in, a, in a virtual format. When we first went to distance learning in April, we provided training for that entire, entire um, first week in April. 
and we had over 14,000 participants in, the, in, the, in that training. We've had those trainings available on, online recorded for teachers to be able to see. We have over 14 pages of, of training that teachers could log in or they could click on, they could see the recordings. We had training for Canvas for, that we opened up to the, to the district all summer. So teachers could get training on Canvas if they, if they chose. We had trainings on both, all of the systems that we're going to use all this week for teachers. So the training opportunities have really been multiple and been there. Um, so we do think that the amount of training that we have, the amount of resources that we have, has been plentiful to at least give teachers that ability to um, get resources or get support if they need. So there's components of it that definitely uh, teachers are given, are given choice. Their, their principals may encourage them to go to a specific training. But if, the re, if a teacher is looking and saying they, they need help with a specific resource, there are multiple avenues for them to, to get help, help with that resource. Even on their Launchpad dashboard, we have an icon that is called OCPS Digital Resources. And when they click on that, if they need help with Canvas, they can click where it says Canvas and they can find guides, they can find uh, e uh, email where they can, they can find additional support. So the, the help is definitely there. So when we went to distance learning, uh, one of the things that we saw change is that normally what you would have is you'd have, because these systems are not new, you'd have a certain component of students who were logging in around 7.30 high school, around 8.30 elementary and around 9.30 middle school. What we saw when we shifted to launch ed, I'm sorry, to distance learning in the spring is that all of those kids that were logging in before basically logged in around 9.30 at the same exact time. So seeing that, we went back and we talked to the vendors and we said, if we are going to have a situation where, and, and this is literally the exact uh, scenario I gave them. I said, if elementary starts at 8.15, at 8.30, and 120,000 students hit the button at exactly the same time, are we prepared for that? And that's the model that we've tried to build from. We tried to build from the model of every student literally hitting the button at the same time and logging in. There are things that are not in our control, obviously, with, with technology, but we've done our best to prepare for students and the load that will be that will come from, from launch at home. And the, lo the load should be staggered because they're going to be on bell schedules based on the school. So talk a little bit about that, Maurice, versus what happened during distance learning. Certainly. So during distance learning, as I mentioned, most students logged in around 930. Because students will be on the bell schedule, it will be much more like what we saw during the regular school day, where in high school, most students will log in at the start of the high school time. But what we expect now is we expect pretty much all high school students logging in around that time and then elementary around that 8.15, 8.30 and middle school around that 9.15, 9.30. So there will be some staggering that we will see in, inside, of, inside, of, um, inside of the login process. So we've also really tried to talk ar about around that with both Launchpad and also with, with Canvas to make sure that they are prepared for that load that they're going to see. We even literally went in and we sent Canvas a copy of our bell schedule so that they would understand where are they going to see different pops in folks trying to log in at any, at any period. Do you think it's going to be smoother this week, hopefully, than it was last semester? Yeah, we, we've put down the groundwork for it to be smoother and then to, to quickly react if it's not. So accommodations for, for students with, with special needs, 
those accommodations are really being, because you were talking about students who may have like an individual education plan or may have a, a, another, uh, like a 504. So there's work that's being done by the schools and by the teachers when they look at the available resources that are there to make sure that they are providing the adequate support. So that really is individualized to each student because each student, it's, it's, it's an individual education plan for that student. So what we've done is we've looked and we've done training, for example, with our exceptional education teachers to say, if you're looking and you may have a student that may need auditory, uh, like visual support, for example, where they may, it may be harder for them to hear, this program provides closed captioning so that you can use this program if that's a support model that you need to, to use. And we've talked to them about, for example, I'll show you when we're in the classroom, about the use of uh, the audio enhancement system to make sure that they are being clearly heard as they're articulating. So what we've tried to do is to point out different features of programs that based upon a child's individual IEP could be used to support the accommodation that they may need. So that's a great question. Uh, we have a website, byod.ocps.net. And on that website, we, we define the, the requirements of a computer that would be used um, by, by students. So to give you uh, some specific examples, in K and 1, the students use iPads. So it may be difficult if a, a student is being asked to open up something on the iPad, but the parent at home is using a laptop. So in that instance, they may want to coordinate with the school and do the device pickup. For two, for two through, through 12, they use a laptop. So the vast majority of resources that we, we do have are run through, through Launchpad. Launchpad is online, so as long as you have an internet browser, you can get to it. Canvas is online. And then the vast majority of textbook resources that we have are all online. So as long as it's a, it's a laptop that at least has a 10 inch screen and has access, let's say to like a, um, a microphone and maybe integrated video camera, a parent should be able to successfully use that device. But if they have a question, they can go to the byod.ocps website and compare the specification of their device to, to what we have listed. And, and Wendy's here too. She could even speak to uh, yeah. school level as far as what that uh, goes. You Did you? That. You have a question for me or for Maurice? Okay. All right. You had mentioned that um, you're still waiting on a couple of devices for elementary school kids. I think you guys are trying to get them. Are they going to be in on time? Um, on the, um, I think they're going to be in on Monday. We're expecting them to be delivered today. Okay. So, so and then. Uh, I don't have the list of schools. I, I think it's like maybe four schools. So, and mo and I think what they had said is most of them are are the new schools. Like I think three of three or three of them I think were new schools, brand new. And you so. also mentioned you're waiting on a PPE orders. Can you say there's enough masks and sanitizer for each classroom at this point for the start of in class face to face? Yeah, I think at this point we have enough for every school. Wendy, you have your full supply that you've received. And then, of course, more coming in. And we have, you know, nine days that additional that more supplies will probably continue to come in. We, we do. We feel like we're in great shape. In fact, uh, way, uh, way beyond even where we were maybe last year at this time as far as the number of teachers that we have. So we feel like we're in, in really good shape to start. We've done everything we can to provide accommodations for those teachers that um, – qualified for accommodations whether they were uh, 65 and older or they had some underlying conditions so we've done we we've done work in that area and certainly we have um, a process by which they can request leave if they need to because of uh, condition and there's a process an ADA process to do that we're always hiring teachers. I just want to put that plug out there. Anytime you have a good teacher out there that wants to come work, you t Principal Ivory will take that teacher every time, won't you? 
So yes, sure. Right now, we have a little over a thousand students at our school, and 220 of them want to come face to face. The rest want to do lunch dead. My teachers, um, I think there was a little bit to answer that earlier question of apprehension at first of the unknown, but this week with the trainings that the district has given and the things that we've done at the school to show them it's going to be okay, this is what we're doing, they're excited. They're super excited here. Um, yet we, I had a couple teachers that needed ADA accommodations and we were able to accommodate that just based on our staff here. They're flexible. They want to help. They want to be here for the kids. So. Here at OCPSA, it has worked, and I'm sure in the district it does as well. You know, yesterday in negotiations, the district had mentioned that some schools have 50% of students that want face-to-face -face and more teachers who want launch ed, so they couldn't accommodate all teachers at all schools. It is up to an individual school on whether or not the principal can fit the teacher's recommendation or, or preference. Yes, and, and we tried to do that as best that we could. Um, I actually had more teachers that wanted to come face-to-face -face than launch dead, so some of them have to do launch dead, and they were okay with it, and they're coming in to do it, and it is working out for them. So, yes. Yeah, well, we have, uh, you know, we have about um, 212,000 students uh, district-wide that would be in all schools uh, you know 63 percent of that uh, rough number 100 and uh, 100 and I don't know you're the math guy Maurice right <laughs> um, you know 63 percent of that is you know 140,000 maybe uh, something in that range that are in there so Yeah, so we've, we've told our, let me move this up a little bit. We've told our parents that when they registered, it would be for a nine-week period. And then after the nine weeks, they could reassess and we could see if they wanted to go face-to-face -face or if they wanted to go launch ed. Uh, so um, it's just, it'll be a nine weeks. Um, Orange County Virtual School is a semester. They can enroll at the beginning of the semester, they stay in for a semester, then they can go back to their home school or they can continue or you can register for Orange County Virtual School at the semester. Well, I mean, Wendy just gave you the information. So, so like we said, the principal owns that information. They got the initial uh, run of the of the registration data given to them, each of them, and then they went through the process of verifying those that they didn't have registration data for, or those that maybe um, selected multiple models. So, her, I'm sure that Principal Ivory staff went through that process of just verifying, and so that's why that's not central. Uh, centrally owned data that's owned at the school. Wendy can give you her numbers, I'm sure, just like if we had any other of the 201 principals, they could give their numbers individually. We just don't have a repository where all those numbers exist. Well, it, the, the best way to do that is to submit that to us. We'll put in a records request, and then it can go out to all schools, and they can, they can provide whatever they have. That would be the best way uh, to do it, the most efficient way. They're, the principals are just going to send it back to, uh, to records because it's probably in their database systems in order to pull them down. So, I mean, Wendy, pro Wendy knows. I'm sure Wendy knows those numbers off the top of her head. Some principals might. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know what was. You, what did you say your percentage was? Right, right currently, now it could change based on. Right. School started. Um, two hundred and twenty want to come face to face, and we have a thousand over about a thousand. So you're about twenty percent. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what. I mean, we can keep an ear out and see if we, you know, when we talk to principals and ask. I just, you know, I don't. I don't, I don't know what the, what the breakdowns are. I don't, my wife teaches kindergarten. I don't even know what the breakdown is at her, at her school. So, um. And any advice for parents who might have kindergartners doing launch ed? I know that they might be breaks kind of built into it, but what would you want to say to parents who might have kindergartners 
say to them, uh, I'm sure it's going to be a headache for some parents on Monday. So uh, for kindergartners in general or students, all, all students? Yeah, I think I, I, I think the um, certainly uh, I don't think uh, young children have issues with devices, right? They they interact with devices, but I think uh, the, especially those that um, aren't as accustomed to the educational model of learning uh, through uh, virtual methods, there'll be a lot of. Um, getting used to that in a way to, uh, and teachers will have to get creative on, you know, keeping their attention and making sure that, uh, that they are. And, and, and parental support is going to be a, a big part of that, obviously, with our, with our young children.